Okay, so this lecture is going to be about pregnancy, but it's going to be complications. And I do have um, several photographs in here of babies, fetuses that um, are not compatible with life. So a uh, potential trigger warning there. This would be a great video to watch, to use your guided notes with, um, because there's some big ticket items here that I'm just gonna briefly discuss but you really need to understand. So a high-risk pregnancy is anything that's gonna cause jeopardy to the mother or the fetus. And it might be a condition from the pregnancy itself, or it might be a condition that was present before pregnancy. We're gonna talk about both. And they do have higher morbidity and mortality for both the mother and the fetus. So um, I discussed this in the pregnancy video, but the immune system is dampened down just a little bit um, in order for the mother's body not to attack the fetus. So that immunosuppression makes her at higher risk for all infections. And that's what we're gonna discuss first is um, some of the infections that uh, can be pretty detrimental in pregnancy. Other conditions um, that can cause at-risk pregnancies, diabetes, any cardiac or respiratory disorder, uh, anemia before pregnancy, autoimmune disorders, and specific infections. Sometimes autoimmune disorders actually get a little better during pregnancy because of that immunosuppression that I just discussed. The infections that we're going to um, focus on are listed on this slide. And just to point out, cytomegalovirus is one of those viruses that we don't talk a lot about because it isn't... Um, such a big deal to most adults, but it can be a really big deal if a, adult, a pregnant adult actually contracts it. Um, it's the most common virus in the world, and it can cause some pretty detrimental effects. Again, I do have some pretty um, uh, rough pictures coming up. Sometimes you'll hear a lab ordered a torch panel, and this is what they are referring to. So this would be a great thing to jot down in your notes, and it stands for toxoplasmosis, O is for other, like um, chickenpox, chlamydia, Coxsackie virus, um, and syphilis, chlamydia, HIV. R is for rubella, C is for that cytomegalovirus, and um, H, herpes. So toxoplasmosis is a uh, infection that is spread in the feces of cats, but fun fact, I just learned that if you have a completely indoor cat, it's not possible to have toxoplasmosis. It's only outdoor cats that come in contact with um, other wild animals, like if they're eating other wild animals. So you can actually see toxoplasmosis in, uh, in some vegetables that are not washed um, because cats sometimes use gardens as their litter box. So um, we do recommend that, that uh, proper handling of the cat litter, um, especially if it's an indoor outdoor cat. But if it's an indoor cat, it's not really that much of an issue. Cytomegalovirus, this is what we call the blueberry muffin rash. You see this in um, babies that were infected while in the womb. And um, these poor babies usually have what inner uterine growth restrictions, uh, IUGR. Sometimes they will have some um, learning difficulties and um, some other growth restrictions, cytomegalovirus. So what is the number one way that we can avoid viral infections when out and about? And uh, what would we suggest to a pregnant woman? You got it, washing your hands number one way to avoid infection. This is herpes infection. This is congenital HSV. This is a baby that was infected while in the womb. So herpes is one of those um, diseases that stays in the body and we will have regular outbreaks and sometimes we'll see outbreaks during pregnancy um, for women that haven't had outbreaks in years because of that immunosuppression that I talked about before. Um, Sometimes uh, providers will put women on suppressive therapy during pregnancy. And um, I just read recently that that's only recommended if they've had an outbreak during pregnancy. We watch very closely for an outbreak. And if there's an outbreak near term, um, they typically won't have a vaginal delivery. They will opt for a cesarean delivery as 
so as not to expose the baby. Now, it, herpes um, has a couple of different varieties, and we are, you know, most commonly um, familiar with the one that we see on the outside of the face, but it also can be genital, and you can spread herpes uh, from mucous membrane to mucous membrane. So, uh, we even if um, it's just on the face, we don't want to be kissing babies or um, uh, oral sex, any of those types of things, you can actually spread this. You can even spread it to yourself if you're not careful. This is congenital syphilis. And unfortunately, we've seen a, we have seen a rise of this. Um, in high-risk areas, it's recommended that testing be done prenatally um, with the prenatal labs, again in the third trimester, and again on the day of delivery. And that is to try to catch all cases. It is treatable with um, antibiotics while pregnant. If the baby does contract congenital syphilis, um, they are going to be in for a 10-day antibiotic and there's often some pretty severe sequelae that goes along with it. Zika virus, it is um, everywhere and this is spread by the mosquito and it does cause lifelong disability with um, something called microcephaly. And so Zika virus is one of those diseases that we really started talking about in the last 10 years or so and trying to avoid being bit by mosquitoes um, is the best way to avoid this. Group B strep or GBS is a, a flora that some women are, are colonized with. It's not sexually transmitted. It's a, it's a flora that lives on our skin, lives on our bodies. We typically don't see any outward infection from it, but if we are colonized, then that bacteria is present in enough quantity that a baby being born through that colony could actually contract it. GBS or group B strep is um, one of the major causes of neonatal septicemia infection, and they can get very sick very quickly. So right now, I want you to jot down in your notes, you're going to go and look up in your resources and your medication resource, what is the prophylactic treatment for a GBS colonization. So we will do a GBS swab in the vagina and rectum somewhere 35 to 37 weeks of pregnancy. And if that is positive, then she's going to hopefully receive two doses of antibiotic in labor. I want you to go and look up what that um, antibiotic is. Um, if you have the resource guide, it's very clearly mentioned in there. It's also in your textbook. And then what do you think we might do if she doesn't get both doses? Um, let's think about that for a minute. If both doses or maybe she delivers too quickly or um, she didn't know that she uh, needed them and didn't come to the hospital until much further into her, her labor. So if she doesn't get both doses, we're going to be on the lookout for signs and symptoms of infection in that newborn. We may even do some labs. And you might want to look up what a septic workup looks like for a newborn. That'll be in your resources. So these are important concepts to be able to apply them as you're building your clinical judgment. So some risk factors for neonatal sepsis, um, ruptured membranes, more than 24 hours. You're going to see a different uh, uh, reference range here for, in a lot of different places, but the the standard is pretty much anything after 20 or anything the water let me start over the rupture of membranes that bag of water being broken for more than 24 hours gives a much greater chance of bacteria entering and so we are on the lookout and that's a major risk factor for sepsis we're on the lookout for signs and symptoms both in the mother before she delivers and in the fetus and newborn any fever over 100.4, we want to investigate. Any odor, the smell of chorioamnitis, we can call it choreo, is um, horrific and you will never forget it once you've smelled it. If you have a sustained fetal heart rate of 160 or more, the most common reason for a fetal heart rate to be um, in the tachycardic range is maternal fever. So those all go together. And then if she's had multiple obstetric procedures, including multiple vaginal exams. So these are all major risk factors for sepsis. And then you can see here the minor risk factor for sepsis. 
And so we are going to be watching very closely. And in another video, we'll look and discuss the signs and symptoms and cues we might see um, to, to uh, detect early signs of sepsis. Here is the immunization in pregnancy. Um, I printed this, I think, in 2021, so it might have changed just a little bit. I've given you the sites to, to go to. These are the ones that we recommend during pregnancy. You, this is a great list to print out and have and know which vaccines can be given in pregnancy and which ones cannot and why they cannot be given in pregnancy. Women who are HIV positive, um, if we can treat them if they have proper treatment with antiviral medications, both pregnancy, delivery, and post-delivery, and the newborn is treated, we can see as low as a 1% transmission, which uh, back in the 80s and 90s, it was um, nowhere near those numbers. It was a much greater transmission. Without treatment, it's about a 35% transmission. Okay, so our vulnerable populations moving into um, our adolescents, they're still developing, still growing. So obviously they're gonna be uh, vulnerable for a high-risk pregnancy. And then our older moms. Now this is very controversial, this number, 35. And if you look at it, it, it is uh, the reason why 35 was determined to be um, advanced maternal age is because that is when the, the lines kind of cross on that chart of statistics. And so um, more, more the, the risks increase over age 35 and um, the, um, the, the problems that we see are at, higher, are at higher ranges over the age of 35. But it does not mean if you're over the age of 35 that you are automatically a high risk pregnancy. It, it, it's just the statistics numbers. Um, in fact, it is not uncommon to see women well into their 40s and even early 50s having babies. That is a common occurrence nowadays. If you're extremely obese, that does put you in the higher risk category, especially if you have other sequelae that go along with that. Um, and then women who abuse substances, that makes them vulnerable. Some of the complications we're going to cover are listed here on this page. And then a few of them, HELP syndrome, gestational hypertension, we're actually going to cover in week four, in module four. So hyperemesis gravidarum is a severe form of nausea vomiting. Remember, uh, some nausea vomiting that lasts typically during the first trimester is um, uh, expected and a common occurrence, but Severe is when the symptoms um, have not resolved or there's a, a weight loss of greater than 5% of pre-pregnancy body weight. And there is a risk of dehydration, um, metabolic acidosis, alkalosis, and hypokalemia. So we can actually get uh, electrolyte imbalance that could be life-threatening. So some of these um, patients actually have to come into the hospital on the med surge floor early in their pregnancy and have a PICC line put in and, and have their um, fluid status managed. We Conservative management, if, it, um, if, if that's the route the provider and the patient decide to go, would be diet and lifestyle changes, things like eating five small meals, um, eating before you get out of bed, uh, always having crackers or something so that you are never... Um, without some sort of calories on board. We're moving on to our conditions that are associated with early bleeding. And these conditions are listed here. Um, uh, spontaneous abortion, ectopic pregnancy, gestational trophoblastic disease, and cervical insufficiency. So our spontaneous abortion, all so-called miscarriage, remember that's the term we use when we're talking to patients, we, in the first trimester, it's commonly due to genetic abnormalities, but we don't always know. There are some genetic testing that can be done on the fetus or even the placenta, um, but uh, we don't always know the cause. Second trimester is more like related to maternal conditions. Um, our number one sign is going to be cramping, contractions, vaginal bleeding. Obviously, our role in that situation is maintain... Um, homeostasis for the mom and her body and empathy and support. And this is where you would probably want to collaborate with your social service department or whatever grief team you have in your um, area. 
Here are the types of spontaneous abortion. It is not a bad idea to understand what each of these mean. You can go through your book and just make a little list of what they mean um, so that you can apply this if you are asked a question uh, on NCLEX or in, other, in any other testing environment. So again, here are some pictures of some early miscarriages. So this is, you can see this is a gloved hand. This is the fetus inside the sac. This is probably, I'm guessing somewhere between 12 and maybe 13, 14 weeks. And um, this actually comes out of a, a, a textbook, but they are, um, the, parent, the patients that deliver these babies are no less excited about these pregnancies than somebody who is in their later term. And um, we do need to recognize that, that there is a loss here and that this is um, a grief process that they will go through. Sometimes if everything doesn't come out, like if the placenta doesn't come out or if there's something else going on, we might have to have what's called a D and C. Sometimes you hear it said very fast together and it sounds like DNC, but it's D and C. It stands for dilation and curatage. And that is the procedure where um, they will uh, uh, open the cervix, they will dilate the cervix and use this sharp instrument called a curette to scrape the inside of the uterus and take out any of those products of conception that have not um, come out on their own. If they don't come out, there's uh, uh, infection risk, uh, continued bleeding risk, and um, it needs to be taken care of. This is also a for uh, one of the ways that a um, surgical abortion can be performed. And so sometimes you hear that, that term dilation and curatage used in that context. There's also something called a dilation and evacuation, a D and E. And again, um, it's using a suction canister. And this is can happen when the fetus has already died and has not um, come away, or if there are products of conception that are still there, or if um, there is, uh, if they're planning a therapeutic abortion. So um, D and E, dilation and evacuation. Ectopic pregnancy, this is when the fertilized ovum does not implant inside the uterus, it's outside the uterus somewhere. The most common place is for it to be in the fallopian tube, but it actually can be in lots of other places, including abdominal. And this is just a picture of showing all the different types. So this is a pregnancy that cannot continue. It will jeopardize the mother's life because you cannot grow a, a baby in your intestine and you cannot grow a baby in your abdomen and, and it will um, rupture at some point and um, cause the mother to lose their life. So ectopic pregnancy uh, care is healthcare for women. So again, possible trigger warning. This is the, uh, a pregnancy in the fallopian tube. This is actually what it looked like. And they had to remove this whole section, this ectopic pregnancy, and the fetus unfortunately does not survive that. There is no way to implant this fetus despite what you may have heard or read on social media. We are not at the point in our technology to be able to implant this fetus in something else. It, simply cannot survive. The hallmark sign is abdominal pain, possibly with spotting. And the laboratory and diagnostic test to diagnose this is a transvaginal ultrasound and serum uh, beta HCGs, serial beta HCGs to look and see um, where we are with that pregnancy. There may be a way to provide medication to stop the growth of that fetus and then the body will absorb if, the, if, the, if rupture is not imminent. If rupture is imminent, um, they may, surgery will be required. And if a woman is Rh negative, we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. If she is Rh negative, it is recommended to have a dose of Rogam after this um, procedure. And here is the tube and here is the fetus. 
Gestational trophoblastic disease is another one of those um, kind of obscure uh, conditions. You don't hear about it a lot. I mention it here because I, I see it on API tests all the time. Um, the exact cause is unknown, but basically it, it, there, are, there are two types. Um, there's no genetic material to it, and it, it's an it's a egg without a nucleus. So it didn't have uh, everything it needed to continue to develop, but um, the body thinks that it's pregnant. So it acts pregnant, and the pa patient thinks that she's pregnant. And um, they usually discover this when they are trying to find fetal heart tones at 15 to 20 weeks, and they're unable to do that. So this will need to be removed with the D and C, dilation and curatage, and um, it can progress to a uh, carcinoma. So the, we are on the lookout for uh, uterine cancer after this. Cervical insufficiency, also called incompetent cervix, is where the, there's premature dilation of the cervix and it is long before the baby is um, viable, able to live outside of the womb. We don't know the exact cause. There, um, so the, the theory is maybe it's due to some cervical damage. Some women are born with a short cervix. There was a medication that was given to our mothers and grandmothers called DES that caused um, the cervix to grow uh, ineffectively. So multiple causes. Um, we often don't know that this is a problem until it's happened with the first pregnancy. If she has been diagnosed with cervical insufficiency, she will be on bed rest, pelvic rest, no heavy lifting. And we might do something called a cervical surplage, which is a procedure to actually um, put a stitch in and help hold that cervix together. So this picture is a little bit of a misnomer because this is showing a full term baby. Um, this is what a normal cervix should look like. It should be thick and stay tightly closed throughout the pregnancy until the end of pregnancy when it starts to thin and efface and starts to dilate. But an incompetent cervix is one that just simply can't hold and opens. Um, transvaginal ultrasound, this is how it is diagnosed. They go in and look at uh, the opening, if it's dilating and if it's defacing. This is that surclage stitch. It's called a purse string stitch. And it is done by an OBGYN early on in the pregnancy to close that cervix up. We will need to remove this uh, for delivery. Um, if there's any bleeding or any leaking, the instructions for the uh, patient to come back in and have that looked at right away because we don't want the cervix to start opening and this to tear through the cervix. And once again, a trigger warning. These are babies that are just on the edge of viability, but not quite ready to live on the outside, unfortunately. And that this is about an 18, 19 week fetus. And these babies um, are just too little and too underdeveloped to live outside of the mother. And if that cervix won't hold them in, um, sometimes it happens very quickly. They, the cervix just opens there's a little bit of bleeding and we have a baby. This is one of the situations they are um, often uh, close to 20 weeks and we hope that you have a bereavement team on in your hospital that can help with that. Many of these things are often donated by um, people that have experienced this before. They have little blankets and there's uh, grief pamphlets. This falling leaf that you see here is a universal sign for a fetal demise or a fetal loss. And then these little pockets um, sometimes are given, uh, often made from donated wedding dresses. Other conditions that might be associated with bleeding in pregnancy, um, and this is usually late bleeding or late pregnancy, placenta previa and abrupto placenta or placental abruption, you'll heard it say, you'll heard it pronounced. So placenta previa, we don't know the exact cause, but we know that the placenta implants over the opening of the cervix. That's called the cervical os. Therapeutic management, it depends on what the bleeding's like. If it's a, a small amount of bleeding that stops on its own, she might go on bed rest and either stay in the hospital or even potentially go home for a while with really good instructions on when to come back. If it's massive amount of bleeding um, that doesn't get stopped, then we will have to um, 
help her deliver and that will be by cesarean section. So the nursing assessment that cannot happen if there's vaginal bleeding and we don't know where the placenta is, is a vaginal exam because we don't want to go in and put our fingers right through that placenta that is covering the off. So if you work in the ER, if you work in labor and delivery, if you're outside in the wild somewhere and someone starts bleeding, we are not doing a vaginal exam until we know for sure by ultrasound where that placenta is. Here's an example of where we would like the placenta to be way up here in the top of the uterus, not covering the opening. This is what we call a marginal insertion. It's getting close, but the baby can still slip by there. The baby needs to come before the placenta because that's how the baby is getting this oxygen and nutrients. And then this is a full placenta previa and um, this baby is not going to be born vaginally because the placenta is blocking the way. Here's another picture of the placenta down in the way. Here's a normal placenta and then a final picture. So you can see very closely, obviously this baby is going to have to come out by alternative route. Placental abruption is different in that the placenta comes off the wall of the uterus, but the fetus is still on the inside of the mother. This is a medical emergency for both mom and fetus because mom is free flow bleeding and baby is not getting any of that blood. It's not uh, connected anymore. And so placental abruption, you can see um, this is a partial abruption and you may or may not have a lot of external bleeding with a partial abruption, but you're going to see signs of fetal distress. Here is a, a abruption that's happening that you are seeing hemorrhage and here is a complete abruption. The cardinal sign of a placental abruption is dark red bleeding, knife-like pain and a rigid uterus. The cardinal sign of placenta previa is painless vaginal bleeding. You will expect to see minimal variability in late D cells on your heart rate with this baby. That makes sense because those are signs that the baby's not oxygenating well. And we are definitely going to be watching for that closely. We want to increase tissue perfusion as much as possible. The textbooks usually say turn the mother to the left lateral position, obviously oxygen therapy, and um, uh, be prepared to go urgently to the OR. Here is a fetal strip. So just to remind everybody, these are the contractions down here and we're looking at the fetal monitor heart rate here. And you can see this baby is already showing signs of reduced variability, that beat to beat change. And we're starting to see some decelerations away from the baseline. And these are classified as late decelerations. So both decreased variability and late decelerations, this baby is saying, I am not oxygenating well and I do not have enough reserve. And if this continues, we get something that looks like this. And eventually we will have a bradycardia and um, eventually fetal death. Hypertensive disorders that we're going to be discussing um, later in uh, module four, week four, uh, we're just gonna save all of this for that discussion. Diabetes, so in the three different types of diabetes, uh, we have type one and type two, and then we have gestational. Those are the ones that we're gonna be discussing. Um, if you have type one before you get pregnant, you're going to still have type one while you're pregnant. If you have type two before you get pregnant, you're going to still have type two while you're pregnant. But if you don't have either type of diabetes, you may see some gestational diabetes that is just simply during pregnancy. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that means. This is my very simplistic explanation of diabetes. So when you have, um, we're gonna pretend like these kiddos are our blood glucose. And we want our blood glucose to go into the house, okay? So our, our, our blood glucose needs to go into the house, which is the cell. And the only way they can get in the cell into the house is if they have the key. So instead of out here tearing up the yard and tearing up the street, which is the bloodstream, the blood vessels, we wanna get them in the house 
And in order to do that, they need the key that fits the door. So this is your insulin, these are your blood glucose, and this is your cell. So now, if you, are, if you have type one diabetes, you don't have a key that fits that door. If you have type two, you don't have enough keys or they're sticky and don't quite fit that lock. And gestational diabetes is you don't have enough keys or they don't fit that lock temporarily while you're pregnant. Okay, why does it matter? Well, diabetes um, is an issue lifelong for the uh, patient, but for the fetus, if they're exposed to high levels of blood sugar, then we see conditions happen like um, cardiac anomalies. And we see growth, uh, these babies grow very, very large. And their little pancreas says, it's okay, mom, I'm gonna help you out. And they start pumping out the insulin in response to the high blood glucose from the mother. And if that happens, once the baby's born and we cut that cord and there's no more high blood glucose from the mother, that little pancreas is still pumping out large amounts of insulin. And we see hypoglycemic um, events for our fetuses. So it's really a condition and, and that blood glucose is uh, sharp. It acts like glass in the vessel and causes long-term issues. So we want glycemic control. That is our goal with diabetes management is glycemic control. And sometimes we do that with diet and good monitoring of diet and blood glucose. And sometimes we do that with medication during pregnancy, insulin. So we start the screening at the first pre prenatal visit. We're looking, at, are there signs and symptoms? Do you have it in your history? Are you already uh, diabetic? And then again, we're going to do 24 to 28 weeks. Um, in that second trimester, they're going to do a glucose tolerance test. And the universal number is under 130. Sometimes you see some facilities will drop that to under 120, but under 130 is what we're looking for. If they don't have, they don't meet that threshold, they might go for further screening. We also are going to be watching those babies very closely. We're going to be watching for their growth patterns. We're going to be watching uh, doing biophysical profiles on them frequently because babies of diabetic mothers have a higher risk of um, fetal demise, fetal death, stillbirth than uh, babies that are not, uh, that don't have diabetic mothers. And this is the ultimate result. This little guy, not so little, has all kinds of issues. He's obviously in the NICU. He is not able to feed. That's what this tube is here. They're feeding him through a tube. He needs oxygen. His blood sugars are uh, out of whack. And so he's getting um, IV fluid here. His poor little muscles have not developed. All this fat deposit is, um, you know, is too heavy and he, his muscles can't control his body. And it's going to take him a long time to get better. So it is a big deal for our baby. Good glycemic control is the key. Anemia during pregnancy, I already talked a little bit about the hemodilution that happens in pregnancy, but if you're already anemic, then your, your anemia is gonna be exacerbated in pregnancy. And we want to encourage a high um, uh, iron diet. And these are some signs and symptoms. These are your cues that you would be looking for. Fatigue, weakness, anorexia, susceptibility to infection. Hmm, sounds like pregnancy, right? So we will have to do some testing to make sure, but pale mucous membranes, tachycardia, pallor, all of these are things that we're looking for to determine if she's iron deficient anemia, anemic. Now, sometimes women will have specific cravings like ice or the ice that used to build up on the old fashioned refrigerators, and they will have specific cravings. And that tells us that we need to look for anemia. And here are some foods that are traditionally high in iron. Now, we've all heard about liver. Most people don't think, well, some people like liver, but I'm not one of them. We've all heard about liver, but what about chia seeds or dried apricots? Or um, these are lentils. Um, these are pistachios. So there are lots of other foods that are high in iron. Talking about maternal fetal blood incompatibility. So we all have our ABO um, uh, blood type, and then we either have a positive or a negative protein around that cell. So if, so ABOs, 
can, uh, incompatibility can cause some issues, but RH incompatibility is, um, uh, can be even a bigger issue. If you have a baby that is a positive blood um, RH type, so they have the protein around their cell and you have a mom that does not have that protein, the mother's body recognizes this as a foreign invader. And so it will start to build immunity potentially and antibodies to fight against this RH positive blood cell. Now this baby is gonna be delivered and go on about its merry way and not be affected. But the next baby that comes along that might have this RH positive blood cell, just like being exposed to infection that you've already had, this mother's body says, oh, we already have mounted an army against this invader. And so they will send those, uh, that army, those immune cells and fight against that baby. So it's the second and third and fourth babies that will have an issue. So we try to stop this process. All women that are RH negative will get what we what is called R, uh, Rho D or Rogam, which is the brand name. And that is um, a medication that we give them at 28 weeks. So in their um, later part of their second trimester, 28 weeks, and then uh, sorry, is that the third trimester, late, the early part of the third trimester. And we give them a dose of Rogam and that depresses their ability to build that immunity against that positive blood cell. Now, we don't know what the baby is when she's 28 weeks pregnant. We don't know the baby's blood type. So all RH negative women will get a dose. It's okay if they don't need it and they still get it. And then after delivery, we will know what the baby's blood type is because we'll take a blood typing from the cord blood. And if the baby is positive, she gets another dose within 72 hours. So make sure you understand this concept. This is one of the reasons that we see pathological jaundice in newborns. So that's one of our cues that we would be looking for if we're seeing pathological jaundice. We'll talk more about that when we get to that lecture um, is if there's an RH incompatibility or potentially an ABO incompatibility. And then we're going to talk about fluid. So um, in a previous lecture, I mentioned there's about a thousand mLs of fluid, give or take a little bit. If you have more than 2000 mLs, we call that polyhydrominous, polyhydrominous. And so one of the issues here is if you have a lot of fluid, that um, stretching of those muscles happen and the, we run out of room. And so we might see preterm delivery potentially with polyhydrominous. Also, the baby has a lot of room to twist and turn in there and we might see an unstable lie in that baby. Or if that water breaks with a gush, we might have enough room for that cord to slip down. So there's lots of issues that can come with polyhydrominous. Um, some of the reasons that cause polyhydrominous are um, uh, anomalies with the baby, neural tube defects, abdominal wall defects, uh, some of our trisomies 13 and 18, or it can be idiopathic, meaning we don't see a cause. It can, it can, it can just happen. Diabetes can cause polyhydrominous. So if we start to measure that fundal height and it's much larger than we expect, then we start to look, um, do we have polyhydrominous? And then oligohydrominos is the opposite. That's when we don't have enough amniotic fluid. So this is less than 500 ml between 32 and 36 weeks. And that's um, done by an ultrasound called an amniotic fluid index, AFI. And we are going to be uh, monitoring very closely because the number one reason that we have oligohydrominos is maybe we had rupture of membrane. Maybe there's a leak in the, in the sac and that fluid is leaking out. And if we have prolonged rupture of membranes, then we have an increased chance for infection. And the other reason that we see oligohydrominos is uteroplacental insufficiency. The placenta is not working the way it should. And if that's happening, then we might have not enough oxygen to that baby. And so these are all signs that we need to be watching very closely. And you'll notice maternal diabetes can also cause oligo. It can cause poly and it can cause oligo. And then premature rupture membranes, I already mentioned, we um, might have an increased chance of infection. So we're going to be on the lookout for those things. We want to know 
several characteristics about the fluid when the when the water does break. If we know that that's what's happening, we want to look at the time it happened, the amount, the color, and if there's any odor. So I like to remember taco. And then you want to know what these words mean. Uh, SROM, S-R-O-M, spontaneous rupture membranes. That means that it happens on its own. And artificial is sometimes a procedure that happens uh, the provider will rupture that bag. So AROM, artificial rupture of membrane. And multiple gestation, if you have more than one baby in there, you have um, increased chance for issues. So this can also put us into a high risk um, uh, potential. And actually in my career, I've seen twins and triplets increase dramatically because we have so many more infertility treatments. And I appreciate you listening along. Be sure to look at your guided notes. And if you have any questions, reach out in the comments.